IRAD a couple of weeks ago. The relays have been messed up. Last week we were able to get them on, uh, but I've done everything we did before to get them on and it's not working this morning. So uh, you're going to have to use the sunlight for your life this morning. So uh, let us turn to page 94 in the front of our worship books to the order of confession and forgiveness and prepare our hearts and minds for worship, and I invite those who can without difficulty to please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Flood the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Solomon had asked this, 
God said to him, because you have asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right, I now do according to your word. Indeed, I give you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall rise after you. The word of the Lord.
Here it again, as St. Paul writes, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This verse tells us about the nature of God and about our situation in life in relation to God. We often hear this verse quoted, and it is a verse that gives people hope in times of trouble, assurance in times of grief, and confidence in times of difficulty. It is a verse that tells us everything is going to be all right if we just trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything is going to be all right because God works for good. When you study the religions of the world, and when you study the religions, especially the ancient world, the beliefs of the Sumerians and the Canaanites and the Philistines and the Amalekites and Syrians and Babylonians and Persians and Greeks and Romans, but even study religions today, you often see in those religions, a god or gods and goddesses who do not work for the good of those who follow them. In fact, some of these religions have story of their gods or goddesses coming down from Mount Olympus or wherever they are residing and coming to earth and actually tormenting people, actually making things more difficult for people in their life instead of doing good for them. But St. Paul was promising us that those who believe in Jesus Christ, God works for the good. That word translated as good, it means what is useful. It means what is beneficial or benefits others, what is profitable. St. Paul is telling us about our faith in Jesus Christ. Within us, God works in every situation something that will benefit us. Something that will in the end, although it might not see it, it seem like it at the time, something that will be profitable for us, something that will be useful. Because God constantly works for good. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father, our Creator, only works for good for us. Even in the midst of evil, even in the midst of tragedies, God will work that for the good for those who love him. So St. Paul is saying everything is going to be all right. You believe in Jesus and rest upon this assurance that God works for the good. God desires our welfare at all times. He is not a God sitting up in heaven waiting for us to step out of line so that he can zap us and punish us for not being perfect. Instead, because God cares about our welfare, he has given to us things to help us in life. The first thing God did in the Old Covenant was through Moses to give us the Ten Commandments. Now, around the time I was in college and seminary in the 70s, there were those people who were beginning to chastise the Ten Commandments, who began to be critical of the Ten Commandments, making ridiculous statements that the Ten Commandments kept people from enjoying life, that the Ten Commandments were a bunch of old laws that prevented you from experiencing everything that life had to experience. That they were things only old fogies would follow, but that if you were hip, if you were with it, if you were living in a modern world, you would ignore the Ten Commandments. Some even talked about them being the Ten Suggestions, that oh, these are just suggestions on how to live. That is all false. God did not give us the Ten Commandments to squeeze the juice out of life. God did not give us the Ten Commandments to prevent us from living lost to his fools. It was the exact opposite. God gave us the Ten Commandments so that we could enjoy life. Because just think about it. Think about our society without the Ten Commandments. Think about a society where murder is accepted as a way to have vengeance on those who hurt you. Think about a society where 
you are married, but then your spouse is free game and anybody else that wants to try to lure them away. Think about a society where stealing is winked at. Think about a society where you are allowed to lie about your name, to bear false witness in order to gain something, or in order to promote yourself, or just because you're jealous of them and you want to put them down a notch. Or think of a society in which covenant is okay. You can covet your neighbor's wife or man sort of maid sort of cattle. And nothing is done about it. Or think about a society in which there is no recognition of God. Where God is claimed to be non-existent. So there he is not honored. His name is not honored and there's no time to worship. There was a society like that. It was called the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics in the Iron Curtain. You talk to people who lived under atheistic communism and how they grew up with the idea that, well, they were just glorified apes. After all, that's what evolution said. Atheistic evolution denied God, denied any creation, denied any higher purpose in life. You were just there to serve the state. So why don't you care about your brother or sister? Why should you have any morals or any values? You were nothing. And when communism failed and Russia and the Iron Curtain crumbled, we've seen growth and explosion in the church as people now are able to once again hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Realized that there was more to life than simply serving the state. That God had created us to live in community with one another and to serve one another and help one another and to serve God. And then God, being concerned about our welfare, this new covenant, sent to us Jesus Christ, his only Son. Sent him into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Send his only son into the world to suffer and die on that cross so that his blood would pay the debt of sin that we owe for the sin that we commit. So that instead of having to try and earn salvation, we were given that gift of salvation by grace through faith, apart from works of the law. God did that for our welfare to make it easy for us to enter into his kingdom, to be a child of the Heavenly Father, to be an heir to all that Jesus Christ won for us through his death upon the cross. Compare that to the religion of the world and the burden that is placed on them to try to earn paradise or nirvana or heaven or whatever they might call it. All the laws and regulations of Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Buddhism, Fusionism, Moodyism, Hare Krishna, Taoism, Shintoism, Sikhism, on and on and on. You have to earn salvation. It's a heavy burden. But the true God, again, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father and Creator, being concerned for our welfare, only working good, sends to us salvation in Jesus Christ. Sends us his only son so that we can wash our robes in the blood of Christ that they come out pure. And we are righteous through him. Though our sins be like scarlet, to God we are as white as freshly fallen snow because of the grace that covers us through faith in Jesus Christ. So God works for good. He is a God who knows our condition and cares what happens. That's why the Word became flesh. It dwelt among us full of grace and truth, so that we have beheld His glory. Glory is the only Son from the Father. That doesn't happen in the religions of the world. Again, like I said, though, they may have their stories of the gods and goddesses coming down from Mount Olympus or wherever and roaming about the earth for a little bit and back up to their residence they flew. 
they didn't experience human misery, human tragedy, human tribulation. They didn't experience death. But Jesus Christ did. Jesus Christ was hungry. Jesus Christ knew what it was to be thirsty. Jesus Christ knew what it was to go without sleeping, to have nowhere to lay his head, to be tired. Jesus knew what it was like to face a very difficult decision as he prayed in anguish in the Garden of Gethsemane that if at all possible, that his father might take this cup from him, but Father, not my will, but thine be done. And because it was a father's will, he willingly went to the cross. And even though he could have called upon Twelve legion of angels to rescue him. He fulfilled his father's will. Because God works for the good. God works for those things that will benefit us, profit us, and will be useful for us, and useful for us in our service to one another. In the name of God. When adversity is ready to strike, God is ready to strengthen because everything is going to be all right. When we, next time we face trial, next time we face trouble, next time we face disappointment, the next time we face something difficult, remember that when adversity is ready to strike, God is ready to strengthen. He will strengthen us. He will give us courage. He will give us faith. He will give us whatever we need in order to go through whatever trial, tribulation, or difficulty it is that we are facing. Because God works for the good. He wants us to be His own and live under Him and His King. Everything is going to be all right. Because not only does God work for the good, but He works for the good in everything. Notice St. Paul says that, and we know that in all things, that all things work together for good. That word of all things means the whole, it means everything. It means all that we will experience in every situation like God works for the good for those who love him. He is that loving Father who turns failures, sorrows, and disappointments into our good. My daddy was afflicted with prostate cancer. As it moved from his prostate to his hips, and from his hips to his spine, from his spine to his shoulder blade, and eventually to a tumor in his brain that triggered the massive cerebral hemorrhage that killed him. Throughout it all, dad always we lived by this verse. Strengthen him through that pain, through that difficulty. And as he watched himself not be able to do the things he enjoyed doing, he had to give a cough. Couldn't play golf anymore. Then he had to give up his love of going to the University of Louisville football and basketball game, which he had done as a season ticket holder for years and years and years. Had to sell his tickets. But he never got that. He trusted. And that Lord Jesus Christ, who through the Holy Spirit inspired St. Paul to give us these words. That in all things God works for good for those who love him. The difficulties in life are not intended to make us bitter, but to make us better. Now, if you've known somebody who doesn't love God, if you've known somebody who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ and they face some kind of difficulty, you may have noticed that they became bitter. But the difficulties of life are intended to make us better, not bitter. As St. Peter tells us in his first letter, it's like gold being refined. And that is why sometimes there is difficulties in life. There's sometimes there are tribulations. That is refining us, making us better for our Lord Jesus Christ in His service. It's not that God afflicts us willingly, it's just that we make choices and there are results of choices. We make decisions and there are results of decisions. But God is always there to strengthen us, to make us better, not make us better. 
Because not only does God work for good, not only does God work for good in everything, but He does this with those who love Him. And this is important to remember. This promise is for the community of faith. This promise is not for those who do not believe. St. Paul is not saying that all things work for good for those who curse God, who hate God, who deny God, who believe that God doesn't exist or that God doesn't have a claim on our life. This is a promise only for the community of faith, for those who believe in Jesus Christ. So those who deny God, those who do not love God, those who resist His love and invitation of salvation, those who want to go their own way, they do not experience this during trial, tragedy, tribulation, or difficulties. They do not see this working for the good. Instead, they suffer the consequences. The St. Paul is telling us with God with those who love him. This is a promise that Jesus sealed on the cross with the shedding of his blood, with his death, resurrection, and ascension. So we can trust in him. For those who love God, that word love means to find joy. For those who find joy in God, this is a promise. There are all types of things in life that promise us joy. Turn on the TV and the TV is filled with, unless you're watching the movie channel, the TV is filled with advertisements and commercials to make you happy. One commercial tells us that all we got to do is get this certain awning that we can roll out and then we'll just be as happy as we can be as our patio now is in the shade of this on. Cologne or perfume tells us we just buy it, put it on, we're going to find all kinds of joy in that because everybody's going to be looking at us. One in the days, we know those things are not true, we know those things disappoint us, we know those promises fail, but in God we find joy. In his son, Jesus Christ, we find that joy of knowing that all things work for the good. We find that joy of knowing that salvation is by grace through faith, that we don't have to earn it. We find that joy of knowing that Jesus himself is preparing a place for us in the kingdom of God that will last for all eternity. Everything is going to be all right. The word call, for those who are called according to his purpose, the word call means Conforming to God's saving purpose. When you're called to the gospel by the Holy Spirit, you're called to God's saving purpose. His purpose for us is to have faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. What is interesting is this word also was translated in other places in the New Testament as saint. A saint is one who is called to be different. St. Paul uses that in almost all his letters in his greeting to the saints in the church in Galatia, to the saints in the church in Thessalonica, to the saints in the church at Ephesus. Not meaning those set aside by the church as being special and called saints, but meaning everyone who believes in Jesus Christ is a saint. Because we are conforming to God's plan, to God's purpose, that saving purpose in Jesus Christ. And the word purpose then means God's good pleasure, God's good intention, God's intent is for all people to be saved through faith in the Son, Jesus Christ. God's good pleasure is that all people will, at the name of Jesus, bend their knee and confess His name in faith. It is God's intention, God's good pleasure, that all people gather at the cross of Jesus Christ and cling to the cross and bring their burdens to the cross so that Jesus may lift them, take them for us. God takes heed to our every need. He knows what we need even before we ask. <coughs> this is why sometimes in prayer, you receive an answer different than that which you are praying for because God knows your need and sometimes when you are praying for something it actually is not what you need but it will only make things worse than that. So God gives you a different answer. God gives you a different place. Because He knows our every need. He takes heed of our every need. So we go to Him in confidence through our Lord Jesus Christ because everything is going to be all right. 
may look dim at the moment. It may seem dark at the moment. But at the end, the sun will rise and everything will be gone. So when we pray, we pray to God with our needs. Thank you. 
The flowers on the chancel stand today are donated to the glory of God.
you for viewing St. John's Lutheran Church in Springfield, Ohio. We are located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio, 45502. Our phone number is 937-323-7508. We have our hope and prayer that you will indeed have a glorious week. In the name of God, 